I won't tell you how old I am. But in the last 30 years, I've done some globe trotting and um, I have suitcases and passports with lots of stamps and much of that has been through ministry, but a lot of that was I was single for a really, really long time and I didn't have children that kept me at the house and so I was able to take fun trips and do some things. But my very, very first trip, um, I grew up in East Texas and if you don't know, there's a pine curtain that kind of locks you in and unless you get down 59 and get out of East Texas, you're kind of trapped. And so um, I um, escaped and I love it. I love the pines, don't, I'm not knocking it, but I, I did get out. But my very first trip out of the country, okay, you ready for this? I was 18 years old and it was my senior trip I was going with 12 of my closest girlfriends and we were gonna go on a cruise to the Caribbean. Now, I did not grow up with a lot of money, so this was a big deal in my family. So I saved my babysitting money for a year. My parents scraped together and you know, supported this and um, I drank Slim Fast for a year. Can I get a witness, okay? I had grown up on Gilligan's Island, not Gilligan's Island, the love boat. Anybody else grow up on the love boat? So I had visions in my head. I also grew up on Gilligan's Island, and that is not what we wanted to happen. Can I get a witness? And so um, I had visions in my head of what this cruise was going to be like. And so I planned, my sweet grandmother sewed all my dresses for those evening affairs, okay? I had, you know, had the slim fast diet for a long time trying to fit in all this stuff. And so I had planned, I had prepared, I had saved my money. And finally, we make the trek from East Texas to New Orleans where this boat is going to be leaving to go on this amazing adventure into the sea. Okay, so I have all these high expectations and hopes. Um, little did I know that cruise ships are petri dishes, but that's a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> I get there, I've got my luggage, I've got my straw hat, I have my fiction to read, I have everything, I am ready. I walk up the gangplank with all of my girlfriends and I walk up to the guy who says these words to me, may I see your ticket? Oh, certainly, here's my ticket. May I see your passport? Excuse me? <laughs> what? My what? I need some identification. You're going to leave the United States soil and you want to go to another country. You need some identification. Um, that was one thing I did not have with me. So I, I will tell you, I can talk myself into anything. I got on that boat, say, oh, yes, she did. I got on that boat. I left the country with my Spanish teacher's grade book and my prom picture. Say, oh, yes, she did. Oh, yes, she did. <laughs> but here's the thing. Uh, we need a passport because God has a destination for our lives, okay? And as we're worshiping tonight, I realize that some of us have heard about this destination, but we have not been there ourselves. We have heard that Jesus came to give us this life and this freedom and all of these things. And we've heard about it through other people. Maybe you've seen their postcard, but ladies, it's time for all of us to experience it. But you gotta have your passport. Look to your neighbor and say, you gotta have your passport. Well, here's the place that we're going over the next four months. We're going to a place called freedom. And freedom might look different than what you expected, but here's what I want to promise you, it is sweet. It is beautiful and is what Jesus died to give to us. I want to look at a couple of verses as we get started tonight. And this is one of the passages that when I first started immersing myself in God's word, when I first turned from the world and darkness and began to follow Jesus, this verse was an awakening to my soul where God says, Marion, I have something better for you than what you've been living in. It's 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and the word of God says, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man has imagined is what God has planned for those who love him. And I remember my early 20s, I just left the world and the darkness and the sin and the shame I was living in. And I made this decision to turn and start following Jesus. And I had not experienced yet the freedom that was coming. 
But God began to make a promise in my heart that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived what God has planned for those who love him. And I want to speak that over your life. When you fall in love with Jesus and you give him your yes and you look at Jesus and say, you are better, no eye can conceive what God has planned for your life, okay? But it begins with him, amen? And it begins with a heart that loves him. I want you to look in your Bibles at John 10. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus describes this freedom, this life in a different way. He acknowledges the fact that over each one of us, there is a battle. And the battle is this. There is an enemy who Jesus called the father of lies, who is the prince of darkness, who wants to hold each one of us captive. He doesn't want us to experience the life, the freedom, all the things that God has planned for us. And so he tricks us, he deceives us, he tempts us, he lies to us so that we will stay in captivity. Someone knows what I'm talking about. But here's what Jesus said about this. He says, the thief comes only, not sometimes, he only comes to steal and to kill and destroy. So Jesus describes the circumstances that most of us, all of us are born in. The one that the enemy has tried to steal from us, he lies to us and he wants to destroy us. But Jesus says, I am stepping into this darkness. That's what we just sang about. He says, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. Most translations say abundance. It's this abundant life. And here's the thing, when you've tasted it, you know it. And can I get a witness? When you've tasted it, you know it. But there's a passport we must have to get there. There's something that we must do to experience this life that Jesus is describing. You can be in church your entire life and not know victory. Let me tell you, I warmed some pews in my life. And I was in bondage to addictions. I was in bondage to shame. I hated myself so much. I was in bondage to people's opinion. You can sit in a pew and not experience the freedom and victory that Jesus has for you. It's a different way. Here's the thing. This life that we're going to be talking about over the next four months, this is precisely why Jesus left his throne of heaven, stepped onto earth, into our mess, into this world of darkness, bringing the light. He came for this precise reason because he looked at you, he looked at you, he sees your life, and he says, I want something better for you. But that better for you and that better for me starts with our ultimate deliverance from our ultimate enemy. Amen? And then progressively, we get to experience the life that Jesus came to give us. This was Jesus' mission. When Jesus first started his ministry, he went into, he went into Nazareth, into a synagogue, with his disciples, and he opened the scroll of Isaiah. Now understand, the words of Isaiah were written about seven to 800 years prior to the birth of Christ. And when Jesus opens the scroll, it says in Luke chapter four that he finds the place where it was written in Isaiah 61. That Jesus opens to this place so that he can declare before everyone, this is my mission and this is what I came to do. Let's look at it together. Jesus said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, oh yes he has, to proclaim freedom for the captives and to release from darkness 
the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them something better, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called, hear this spoken over you, oaks of righteousness, a planning of the Lord that he would be glorified, a planning of the Lord for the display. Imagine your life, a display of his splendor. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus has something better for you. Here's the thing. When Jesus came, he declared pretty clearly his mission statement. He came to set the captives free. Now, since the dawn of time, God created heaven and earth he created man in his own image, mankind, male and female were created in his image. He placed us in a garden where we had fellowship and oneness and relationship with him. And into that garden slithered a serpent. And that serpent was the enemy, the thief, the liar, the destroyer that Jesus talked about. This was Satan. And he came up to our first parents and said, I've got better for you than God does. God's holding out on you. Take this, even though God said this is not good for you, don't believe God, he's not good, take this and eat. And in that moment of decision, our first parents chose to believe, everyone say chose to believe. They chose to believe the enemy rather than the voice of truth, okay? And at that moment, Sin, devastation, destruction, disease, heartbreak, divorce, everything that makes this world what it is became a reality. But in the middle of that garden, God made a promise to redeem us and that promise unfolds all throughout scripture and ultimately when Jesus stepped up and said, I came to set the captives free, he was fulfilling thousands and thousands of prophecies about his own arrival. Now here's something I need to quickly clarify. Jesus came as a sacrifice, okay? And his sacrifice of his own blood paid the penalty for our sin, collective sin of humanity, okay? And when we put our hope and faith in Jesus, we are redeemed, we are forgiven. We have freedom, everyone say freedom from the penalty of our sin. What is the penalty? Well, the penalty of my sin is death. The penalty of my sin is separation from God. The penalty of my sin is that my soul is not alive because it was intended to be connected to my creator. Now, here's the gospel. Here's the beautiful thing. When I trust in Jesus that he is enough, that he took my place, at that point, I have freedom from the penalty of sin. Everyone say hallelujah, praise. Come on, that's good stuff. But church, we don't stop there. Here's what's burning in my bones. Freedom is when I know through Jesus and his Holy Spirit, I can have freedom from the power of sin. Someone say amen. I do not have to be a captive to that garbage anymore. Come on, right? I don't have to con continue the line that has passed from generation to generation to generation in my family. Jesus has something better. Jesus offers us freedom in him from the things that hold us bondage, but we have to take hold of that by faith, people. We have to take hold of that. But let's be honest, can I ask a question? As we looked at the fact that God said, I came to set the captives free, and I have a, a life that, for you that no eye seen, no ear has heard, nor mind has conceived. I really want you to ask yourself this question. 
Is that my reality right now? Am I experiencing the victory in Christ over fill in the blank? Am I seeing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love for people and love for God? Am I experiencing God's joy? Am I experiencing peace right now? I'm going to get hard. Am I experiencing self-control right now? Or am I still enslaved? Or am I still mastered by something Jesus died to set me free from? Now, as we know last semester, we're not going to say our life is going to be free from storms or trials or heartaches. But here's what the reality is. In the midst of those things, we can be victorious women. In the midst of those things, we can be women who are free of soul and alive that the enemy does not win, right? And so I want you to look inward and let's be honest. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit's been showing me stuff in me that he's like, that's not freedom. I have better for you still. Let's not get stuck. Is there a consistent pattern of defeat? keep falling in the same temptation, the same area, the same struggle, the same fight with your spouse, the same battle over and over and over again? Is there a consistent pattern of fear where you don't have peace, you don't have joy because your mind is filled with scenarios that where the world or what the world says is bigger than what God says? Is there a consistent pattern of insecurity where they don't like me, they don't want me, they don't love me? Let me just, just give you a spoiler alert. That voice is from the pit of hell who doesn't want you in community and doesn't want you living the life that God purchased for you with his blood. Can we just all just agree on that, okay? And so, if I can look and be honest and say, hey, when I get about eight o'clock at night and I have lost it with my child and there's an anger in me that wants to rage, that is not the freedom that Jesus bought for me, amen? But we gotta be real, okay? If we're not real, we're not free. Say that to your neighbor. If we are not real, we are not free. We can't continue to say, that's just the way I am. Do you know who wants us to say that? The one that wants to keep us captive to the thing that Jesus died for. We can't just say, well, my mama and my grandma and mama were like that. I don't care. I don't care. Because we're either going to believe that Jesus has something better and we can take hold of it by faith or we're going to live the rest of our lives decade after decade after decade looking at someone else's postcard from a place called freedom. Oh, taste and see that he is good. Oh, taste and see how he is good. There's an entire generation that the enemy has spoken over them about their identity, that this is who you are. And through those identities, he began to tell them, this is not only who you are, but this is what you're gonna do because this is who you are. And he's taking Christian children captive through a lie about who they are, and it's gonna to stop today, mamas. Because there's a place called freedom and there's a life of victory that is ours when we begin to believe that Jesus did not just die so that I could go to heaven. Amen? That's awesome. But Jesus died so that the saints of God could have victory on this earth and show the splendor of our God to a watching world. Amen? So freedom is our destination. This is what Jesus gives us. This is what he died to offer us. And this, ladies, is our inheritance, okay? You hear about these 
people who pass away and they leave a will and then their kids start fighting over their inheritance, right? I want this, I want that. Can we just start fighting in the Holy Spirit for the inheritance that Jesus says is ours? Can we just start doing that? And looking at God's word and when God's word said, you are this, you have this, start to actually believe it and take it like it's a will from God and claim it, right? And tell the accuser, my advocate in heaven who stands in my defense has said over my life, this is who I am. And when we get that audacity and we get that boldness, then the thing that used to have power over us begins to cease to have that power because we can say with authority, you are not the boss of me anymore. We can say to that voice that wants to define us according to the world standard, that is not who I am anymore. We'll start listening to the Holy Spirit in us who convicts us. You know why he convicts us? Not to shame us and call us a sinner, although sometimes we need need to see our sin, He convicts us to say, girl, you're not a slave anymore. You're a child of God. You're not a slave anymore. You're a child of God. Have you ever heard the word trespasses? That Jesus saved our sins and our trespasses? For a long time, I didn't know what that meant. You know what trespasses are? When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. They came out of slavery, right? And now they're God's people. And God's taken them into a land called the promised land where they're gonna live and have abundance and victory. Sound familiar? Well, when they would begin to act like the world around them or bow down to the idols of the world around them, it was called trespasses because they were living like slaves again. Here's the thing. Jesus did not just come to save us from our sin, but he also came to liberate us from our slavery, our trespasses. If you're a believer in Christ and you have an addiction, no shame on you, but God wants freedom for you. And your addiction may be people's opinions, it may be a substance, It may be spending, but ask how many people with credit card debt if that's free. It may be food. Ask how many people who are struggling with obesity if that's free. Here's what I wanna be very clear about. The God who died for you loves you and he loves us too much to let us stay in captivity. He loves us too much for us to stay in captivity because freedom is our destination. So how do we get there? If freedom is what Christ came to offer us and this freedom is a state of my soul where I am not bound by anxiety, I'm not bound by people's opinion, I'm not bound by needing this and this and this, I'm not bound by shame, I'm not bound by self-hatred, I'm not bound by comparison. I'm not bound by bitterness. I'm not bound by jealousy. Everybody's toes hit? Yeah, everybody, come on, stick them out. How do we get there? Jesus tells us. In John chapter 8, there's this interesting, amazing conversation. Now, as you read through the Gospel of John, um, Jesus very clearly declares who he is and why he came, okay? Okay. But over the course of, you know, this, this gospel, you will see the religious leaders who are bound up in anger. They're bound up in striving to be perfect in their own strength. They're bound up in religion. Oh, don't worry, people, we'll get there. And they don't like that Jesus is saying, just come to me and I'll give you life. Just come to me and I will declare who you are. They don't like that because they want people trapped in the religious system, okay? So there's these conversations over and over. And so this one conversation is about the issue of freedom. And here's the context. 
there was a woman caught in adultery. And those religious leaders wanted to shame her, stone her, and kill her. And Jesus stood in her place and said, over my dead body, right? And he said, if you're without sin, which none of us are, he said, cast the first stone. And they all walked away and they're a little, you know, okay, I can't really throw a stone because I know I have sin. And then Jesus stepped up in the middle of the scene and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will walk away from darkness and walk in the light. It's another metaphor for freedom. And so they're all up in arms about this. How dare you? Who do you think you are? And then Jesus said, John 8, if you hold to my teaching, everyone say if, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth. And what does the truth do? The truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very I truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. So Jesus steps into the scene and says, I'm gonna tell you there are two different ways of life. And there's one where you're in slavery to this thing. And you can try on your own, you can try to have all the resolutions, you can make all the lists, and you can listen to all the podcasts, and you're still gonna be a slave, but if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. And that's what we're looking at tonight. And Jesus, who is the son of God, who came for the sole purpose that we would experience the freedom that only he provides, he tells us how. He says, it is the truth that will set you free. Everyone say it with me. The truth will set you free. Now here's the thing. What happened in the garden? Satan lied. Mankind fell into captivity. So Jesus steps on the scene as our liberator, as our emancipator, and he says, you will know the truth. And he says, I am the truth, and the truth, the person of Jesus, and his word will set you free. Now we come to a point of decision. I either believe that or I don't believe that. I wanna talk about two types of slavery. I ordered some handcuffs on Amazon Prime at 11 a.m. today and requested that they would be here before I left my house at three o'clock. The little delivery notice said they would. They did not arrive. So imagine with me that I have said handcuffs that my Amazon Prime account has paid for. Imagine with me, I have those. They are not here. So we're all gonna have to use our God-given imagination. The way the enemy seeks to hold us captive Even those of us who are children of God, those of us who have been set free from the penalty of sin, he wants to still hold us captive to the power of sin. I want you to imagine those handcuffs, which all do have two sides, okay? And one side is slavery to sin. And every one of his cuffs begins with a lie, okay? Imagine this. His lie says, this thing, our desire, our temptation will satisfy me. And like a little dog that's offered a little treat, we see it, we think that will satisfy, that looks good, and we take the bait, and then before we know it, we're in the kennel. Can I get a witness? Amen? Like, that's what happens. It can happen on a micro level or a macro level. It can happen in different ways, but one side of Satan's handcuffs is the temptation, and behind every temptation is the lie. Here's what the lie is, that this thing is gonna satisfy my soul more than God is, okay? Whatever it is, it's that something is better than Jesus. 
okay? I'm boiling it down real simple, okay? So that's one side of the handcuffs. And if we're in prison to something that we can't break free of, we have to get to the root of it. What lie am I believing that this is holding power over my life? Okay, so the other side is our slavery to striving. Okay, everyone say striving. This is where the lie, the root of is, is I must do, or I must be, or I must strive, or I must earn in order to be loved, in order to be accepted, in order for God to want me, in order for people to like me. And so we strive, and we perform, and we get on the treadmill, and we try to be, 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 and I'm gonna be a good Christian person, so I'm gonna check all the boxes, I'm gonna keep all the rules, and we're in prison to performance. Someone should be saying hallelujah, because you're exhausted. You're exhausted. Trying to put on the face and being perfect and all that, it's exhausting. Do you know how long it takes to even to get your mascara done half the time? It's exhausting. But freedom is both. He didn't just come to set us free from this sin and this, the things that control us. He also wants to set us free from the way we're trying to find love apart from him. So what is it? They're both unlocked with truth. They're both unlocked with truth. And in every circumstance, here's the thing, there is a truth of God that we proclaim from our mouths when we're tempted. There's a truth of God that we plant our feet on and we believe in our soul that resists the enemy, resists the captivity wants for us, and we exercise our faith. We're not passive. Passive people get taken captive. Amen, right? Don't be at the back of the pack. Don't be the one struggling. Passive people get taken captive. Be active in your faith that where you go, but the word of God has declared this is who I am. And we proclaim the truth, and the truth will set us free. This is begging for an example. I'll give you two. Uh, when I first came to Christ, you know, hot mess express, let me just be real honest, you know. Um, if there could be a captivity, I was captive to it. Addictions, all of the stuff. But one specific area that I was very much captive to was lying, okay? Because as a little girl, I had learned to lie to protect myself. Uh, you know, as an abuse victim, I'd learned to lie to protect myself. And as I grew up, lying just became a habit. I could tell a good story, I'd look in your face, tell you a fabrication, and it was part of my old nature. Well, that's, you know, Jesus came and died for my sin, my past sin, my present sin, my future sin, all of it. But did he want me to stay captive to that habit? Oh, no, he didn't. Why? Because that's not who I am. And so as a born-again believer, I was in a situation where I told a story, and it was not true, okay? It was not true. And I, I walked away from there. I went home. I sat in my bed, and at that time, I developed a habit of having a quiet time with God where I opened the Bible, and I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, where the conviction not to shame me but to say, that was not declaring the splendor of God's glory. That is not who you are. And I felt the conviction and I experienced repentance where I said, God, I acknowledge that this has been holding me captive. I recognize it and I turn from it. Jesus, you are better than this. Jesus, I need your help. And in that, I went back to those people and I confessed to them, I said, I have just lied to you. And it broke the power of the sin. But here's what I had to do. I had to agree with God about my stake. And I had to declare and really look at the root of it. What's the root of this? Lying, the lying, the habit of lying, what was the enemy saying that you have to pretend to be someone else? in order for people to like you, 
in order for people to love you. You can't be truthful. And I had to lay that down and declare, I am loved because of Jesus. I am whole because of Jesus. That is who I am. That is who I am. So we can be a slave to sin until we declare the truth over our lives and the truth of our situation. And we can also be a slave to striving. Here's what it means to live in the freedom of Christ. I don't have to perform for God to accept me. Do you know that you're accepted because Jesus is enough? Say amen. You're accepted because the blood of the lamb covers you and says you're holy and pleasing to God. And when I feel myself, oh, if I don't do this, or if I don't act like this, then people might not like me, or God might be upset at me, I have to be honest and look at that thing and say, there's a lie in my heart that is keeping me from freedom. So we acknowledge it, we turn from it, and we say, Jesus, you are better. Do you know why the enemy wants to keep us in striving? Because when you're working really hard trying to be perfect on your own, guess who you don't love? You don't love Jesus. Guess who you don't glorify? You don't glorify Jesus. And when I rest and say, I'm a big hot mess, but Jesus, you're enough. I can't be perfect, but Jesus, you are. I can't do enough to earn God's love, but I am loved because I am in Christ. And then your life begins to set free. Your life begins to set free. That's why in Galatians 5, Paul says, it is for freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Every one of us, every single day, we're going to fight battles. I'm going to be truthful with you. We all start in 2022 like, woohoo, new year. All, you know, starting fresh. I'm going to be truthful. We all stink, okay? We all need Jesus more than we can even imagine. And he is so much better than we can even imagine. And freedom is when we know I can't do it, but Jesus can do it. Amen. And so we have to stand firm and realize we're going to have temptations. We're going to face challenges. But we say not today, Satan, right? We say not today. And here's how it works. Our passport to freedom. If you've ever traveled out of the country, you know, you go up, you hand them the passport, you go to that little window, they take out a stamp, and whatever country you're going to, they stamp it. It's real fun. But our passport to this place called freedom, it's stamped with surrender. Surrender. Until we come to the place that we bow the knee, and we tell the Lord, I'm stuck. I can't change me. I need help. I can't do it myself. Until we come to the point that we recognize the things and the areas that we're continually falling into bondage, until we come to that place of surrender and say, Lord, I need you. And we just say, you are God and I am not, we won't cross over into the freedom that he has. That's why Jesus said this. Jesus said this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a kind of a puzzling statement, isn't it? You would think if we're going to this place that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived, then we need to do a lot. We need to work at it. And Jesus said, oh, no, no, no. 
if you want to enter into the life that I have for you, then the old you has to die. You have to take up the cross to follow me. What does that mean? When we come to Christ, we come and say, here I am. I take your life for my life. I lay down my life to take up your life. And when we come to that sweet place of surrender, that's where we begin to experience the abundance. That's where we began to experience what no eye has seen nor ear has heard. Here's the reason we have to. Because the Holy Spirit of God cannot move and flood and pour into our lives if we're putting a wall up, okay? He can't do it. And it's till we open our hands, release control, and say, have all of me. Take my life. It's only when we surrender do we experience the freedom. Our passport into this place is freedom. That's why Galatians 2.20 says this. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Some of us, life has to get hard before we bow the knee, right? For me, there was a season of brokenness, brokenness, where because I was hard-headed and I was stubborn and I pray over my kids that they do not have to come to Christ on the path I did. Until I cried out, to the Lord, I had to suffer in some darkness and in my sin. I had to suffer in it until I came to a place of surrender that says, you are God and I am not. You are God and I am not. And when I did that, here's what happens. His mercy meets us there when we come to the cross empty-handed. I can't bring anything to the cross. But ladies, I, I'm showing you this posture because here's the thing. The Christian life is supposed to be lived here. We don't get up from receiving salvation and go, thanks Jesus, I'll take him from here. How's that working for you? It doesn't work. The Christian life is a posture of surrender. God, I can't raise this kid. I can't do it. I can't do it. Holy Spirit, help me. I surrender control. I surrender my will. Help me. Fill me, help me, and he does. Because Jesus didn't just die on a cross. You know what he did? He was risen again, and he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. He's the resurrected king, and he gives us resurrected power when we surrender. There can only be one God on the throne. It's either gonna be me or Jesus. And if I'm trying to do it my way, in my strength, for my will, and my glory, he's going to keep letting me do it until I see how stupid it is. Surrender is the posture of the Christian life. There's no other way, but it's the most beautiful, glorious, it's the most abundant thing. I can, it's like... I just heard a news story about a girl who escaped from North Korea, and I'm gonna botch it up, but that basically she's telling the world they have no idea what happens outside of North Korea. I mean, they're completely brainwashed. They live in darkness. They think everything is like North Korea. They're all starving. They're all, you know, have to worship the dictator. But she gets out and she's like, what? This is the world? Until you surrender to Jesus, I cannot describe to you what life is supposed to be like, but I wanna tell you from one captive who's been set free that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Have I had hard days? Absolutely I have, have, but I had Jesus, and you cannot explain life to people until you know the Prince of Peace, the mighty God until you know the presence of the great I am. You're like, yeah, this is hard, but my God is good. Yeah, this is tough, but he is with me and he is more than enough. 
Your last note says this. That's why freedom in Christ is a declaration of dependence. Freedom in Christ is a declaration of dependence. As all the Americans in the room were like, uh-uh, I like me some July 4th. Give me some fireworks. Give me a hot dog. We think it's a declaration of independence. You know why that's a lie? Because Satan slithered into the garden. He said, be your own God, independence yourself, and you will have life. How'd that work out for us? Not so good. So what we do when we repent and come to Jesus is say, I declare I am dependent on you and in you alone I will have life. And when we understand that freedom begins when we declare complete dependence on the one who came to set us free. That's where it begins. It's freedom in Christ. When a, there's a song by Hillsong and it says, this line, it said, I found my life when I laid it down. Only someone who's tasted that understands. I love history. I'm a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln. First of all, he was a godly man. You should read some of his prayers. He was a godly man appointed for such a time as this and a day when there was darkness over our land. Slavery is a blight on American history. It's, it's something that we have a corporate shame about, okay? Abraham Lincoln was raised up for such a time as this to be the voice that said enough is enough, okay? And God used him, but before he was president and watched the ugliest days in our nation unfold, he was a man who loved God and who had a passion for truth. And history has it, legend has it, that Abraham Lincoln was traveling and he was in New Orleans one time. And while he was in New Orleans, he passed by the place that is still there today where they held slave auctions. And he was not there as a participant, but he stood at the back and he watched as this occurred. And the Holy Spirit in him was grieved. The Holy Spirit in him was angry. The Holy Spirit in him also said, do something. And so Abraham Lincoln from the back of the room began to raise his hand as the bidding happened. And there was a woman up there being bid on and the people were trying to buy someone who was made in the image of God. And from the back of the room, Abraham Lincoln began to bid. And at the end, he spent his money and he purchased her. And he went up to collect her and he looked in her eyes and said this, I bought you to set you free. To which she looked back in astonishment, what do you mean? I purchased you to set you free. To which the woman said, then I'm going with you. She understood that true freedom for her would only be found in the world at that time by attaching herself to the one who had emancipated her. And tonight, Jesus speaks over us. I came and died. I bled my blood to set you free. And the response of our soul should be saying, Jesus, I'm going with you because you are better. You are better. So every time you're tempted by the pornography, you look at that and you say, Jesus is better than this. Every time you're tempted to find soulless in the bottle, you look at that and you say, Jesus, it's better than this. Every time you talk to that coworker where the enemy says, he really gets you, your husband doesn't really get you, he really understands you, you turn away and you say, Jesus, it's better than this. For every place that the enemy wants to take us captive, we turn our eyes upon Jesus and we remember the one whose blood was spilled to save our souls and we run hard, hard after him because he is better. Jesus, we love you in this place. And I pray God new destinies over the women in this room that they've been walking in generation after generation of brokenness and bondage. And I pray tonight that faith would well up and rise up in them and they would say enough is enough, I'm going to Jesus.
And I ask God that you would give them truth, specific truth that counteracts the lies they believe about who they are, about their identity, about their worth, about their value. And I ask God that you would put a sword in their mouths, give them a sword of the spirit to declare, I am who God says I am. I am his beloved, I am free, I am chosen, I am who he says I am. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.